Good morning. I'm going to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. It's about our text for this morning. Ken, I think he's still in Kansas with the funeral he was doing. I mean, oh, gee. Uh, with the wedding. Sorry, that was not a joke. It's not, sorry. Gee. With the wedding that he was doing with Hi and Molly. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> That was not the icebreaker I intended. <laughs> With the wedding that he is, did for um, Hi, I should sit down right now. <laughs> for Hi and Molly. Whew. 20 feet, 23 years, that is such a blessing. We're getting old together. We're pressing on in Christ. Let's continue to the very end and do it walking by faith, and loving each other. Thanks for being here this morning. This is our text. Let's read it, and then we'll pray, and we'll dive in. Mark 12, 18. Some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife... And leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving behind no children, and the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are mistaken that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. Let's pray together. Father, it is our great desire this morning to come as your people by faith to your word that we might behold your son, and be changed. God, I pray for your spirit to help us, to lead us into the truth of this passage, to encourage our hearts, to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our resolve that Christ is life, that Christ is our all in all. God, I pray that you would lift burdens this morning, that you would strengthen feeble hands, that you would set our sight firmly upon heaven, on what is to come, on a resurrected Christ who is ours. God, thank you for this text. Thank you for your people. We pray that you would help us now as we study it and hear it and, and wrestle with it. May Christ be glorified. We pray in his name. Amen. Our text this morning deals essentially with two key issues, marriage and the resurrection. And Jesus deals with them very succinctly during an exchange with a group, with a religious sect, called the Sadducees. And simply stated, if we boil down everything we just read, this is what the text says. Jesus answers their question this way. He says, you're wrong. There is no marriage in heaven, and there is most certainly a resurrection. That is essentially what Jesus says. And I want to spend our time then wrestling with the implications of what Jesus is saying. From three vantage points. First, I want to give us a brief theology of disagreement. Jesus disagrees with the Sadducees. 
And I think how he does it is worth noting. Second, I want to explore the implications of the absence of human marriage in heaven, which is very important if we are to think rightly and do rightly in the human institution of marriage, a brief theology of marriage. And then finally, the implications of the resurrection that Jesus affirms definitively at least three times in this text, the dead will rise. And so we'll conclude with a brief theology of the resurrection. Our context is this. We're in the final week of Christ's life. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem was in chapter 11, as well as Jesus clearing the temple. And there is a building tension between Jesus and the religious leaders. And they are sending wave upon wave to Christ with questions, with entrapping entrapping questions. And the goal is not to learn from Christ, but to trip him up, to catch him in some statement that would bring his ministry to an end. And so the stakes here in this final week of Christ's life, of Christ's life are very high, and the time is very short. And there are two necessary background topics that I think are helpful in understanding this text. The first is some background on who the Sadducees were. And the second is what is called the law of leveret marriage in Deuteronomy 25. The law of the brother-in-law. Leveret in Latin means brother-in-law. First, some background on the Sadducees. The Sadducees were an elite aristocratic priestly group. Not much is known about them because none of their writings remain. But the Bible tells us very specifically many of the things that they believed. And the first century Jewish historian Josephus helps us round out a little bit as well. They were primarily known for denying the resurrection. Our text says this, Acts 23, 8 says this as well. They also didn't believe in angels or a spiritual realm. And if you grew up in the church, you probably remember singing a little song. I don't want to be a sheep. Bah. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. And I don't want to be a Sadducee. Why? Because they're just so Sadducee. Why? It's, 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 a, it's a necessary memory device. Bear with me. Why are they so Sadducee? Because they don't believe in the resurrection. You'll remember that better because of that. Raise your hand if you sang sang that as a little kid. I love that song. Stop moaning. (laughs) Josephus, in his work, Jewish War, wrote, As for persistence of the soul after death, penalties in the underworld and rewards, they, the Sadducees, will have none of them. They were known for their studying and teaching of Old Testament law. They were surprisingly the theological conservatives of the day. They believed in the scriptures and only the scriptures. They rejected oral tradition. And they emphasized almost exclusively the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, as the authoritative word of God. They were part of the group that John the Baptist called out in his ministry as a brood of vipers in Matthew 3.7. And in Matthew 16, Jesus warned the people about their teaching. And they persecuted Christ during his earthly ministry. And they persecuted the apostles in the early church. They were, along with the Pharisees, the bad guys of the Gospels. They valued their traditions and their interpretations and authority. And they rejected Christ as the Messiah. And so they come to Jesus with a theological question from the text of Deuteronomy 25 regarding marriage in the resurrection. And they quote Moses to Jesus to expose the impossibility in their minds of a resurrection after death, which Jesus was very clearly promoting and affirming. And since we know from the text that they didn't believe in a resurrection, we know the entire thing is a setup. It's a mockery of Christ. To stir up the crowd, to sow these seeds of doubt so that the crowd might say, yeah, that's a great question. How can there both be a law of leveret marriage and a resurrection? It would make heaven a big marriage mess. 
People running around wondering, are you my wife? Are you my wife? Are you my wife? But it is an interesting question. And Jesus does answer it. They pose a scenario in which a man dies and his wife is childless. Then his brother marries her in obedience to Deuteronomy 25. And this goes on and on until all seven brothers had died. And then the wife dies. And the question is, in the resurrection, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, they don't believe in the resurrection, who will, be, who will she be married to? Listen to Deuteronomy 25.5. When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. Very foreign to us, the design of the law was to preserve the family name and the inheritance in Israel. Your lineage, your heritage, your name would, in a sense, cease to exist in Israel if you died childless. And this would be tragic. And so the law protected this very cultural idea, but something that God affirmed in the law. This law is prominent. It's sort of the backbone of the book of Ruth. Where Naomi sends Ruth to Boaz because he is a close, a near relative, and her husband has died, and he ends up marrying her. And so the stage is set for Jesus to answer this question for the Sadducees and all that are listening. And he does. And so first I want to address how he does it. And so number one in our outline is a brief theology of disagreement. Why is this important? Aren't Christians peace-loving peacemakers, right? We shouldn't be known for our disagreement, for being argumentative, for the sake of argument. So in one sense, yes, we should be peacemakers. In another sense, no. In another sense, Christians are very loving contrarians because we must converse about the truth of Christ. The Great Commission, in one sense, is a, claw, is a call to global, persevering disagreement. To make disciples is to confront the unending falsehoods and lies that people come up with so that they can reject Christ as their Messiah, as their Lord and Savior. Ministry, in some sense, is disagreement. Counseling is disagreement. Parenting is loving disagreement. In different settings and to different degrees, we are all being corrected toward conformity to the scriptures and submission to Christ by faith. It's God's love to us to disagree with us in the gospel and call us to repentance and faith. And so we must learn to disagree like Jesus disagreed, humbly according to the scriptures, for the sole purpose of moving people away from the falsehoods and the lies of the devil to the saving knowledge of Christ revealed in the text of scripture. And so how does Jesus disagree? I'll give us a, a few examples. First, he, he disagrees very, very clearly in the text. Is there any question after reading this text that number one, the Sadducees were wrong, and number two, exactly where Jesus stands on the issues? He is very clear that they are, in fact, wrong. He says it three different ways. Verse 24, is this not the reason you are mistaken? He uses the rabbinical device of answering a question to a question to get to the point that you don't understand the scriptures or the power of God. Verse 26, have you not read? Verse 27, you are greatly mistaken. Using the same word from verse 24, and it's really just two words put together. The first is the word for badly, and the second is the word for mistaken. And so it's very succinct. Jesus finishes his address to the Sadducees by saying, badly mistaken. You blunder. You err badly. Does this sound like Jesus? He's so forward. He's so opinionated. Does he, does he really talk like this? 
Now, we can't import emotion into us, but the text is giving us repetitive, clear disagreement with falsehood. Absolutely, Jesus talks like this. Jesus didn't deal in the gray or in the fuzzy relational realm of worrying so much about offending that he never actually said anything direct, clear, concise. His was disagreement for sure, but motivated by perfect love. The second aspect of Jesus' defense is that it is scriptural. He's reasoning directly from the Old Testament scripture as they were to him. That the scriptures are authoritative. They are the issue in this discussion. He says, you don't understand the scriptures or the power of God, the character of God revealed in the scriptures. And remember who the Sadducees were. They were rich, elite, religious aristocracy. And so our first response to this kind of rebuke, I think, should be, ouch. This is, this is amazing how he's going after these people. You don't, you don't understand the scriptures. They were the cultural authority on the scriptures. They were very powerful. This was their field, their specialty. Jesus is clearly stomping on their toes in this text. One commentator said, it is like telling a Wall Street investor, you err because you don't understand investing. Like telling an NFL quarterback, you lost today because you don't understand football. And Jesus is absolutely right. Both to the Sadducees and to us, they err, we err, we blunder when we don't know what the scripture says. Or we don't understand what they mean. We don't understand them correctly. We are utterly lost without the word of God. This book is so important. God speaks when we open the Bible. And in, unless he speaks to us in an objective, readable source, in this book, we are utterly clueless in this life. The Sadducees were quoting Moses, but Jesus disagreed with their interpretation of Moses, with their application of the Leveret Law of marriage, with their conclusion, which means just because the Bible is open somewhere doesn't mean that truth is being revealed. Beware the Bible teacher. Be Berean. Be about the text so that you can refute error, so that you can present the gospel to those who bring falsehoods. And then in his response, Jesus references Exodus 3 to prove his point from the text. There really is a resurrection, and it's right there in Exodus 3. Now, please don't hear me or take this as a license to be obnoxious. Some of us love to disagree. We love too much to disagree. We love all the emotion that comes with disagreement. I was a high school debate guy. It made me a complete jerk for a decade because no one could prove their point because all logic was flawed. And anytime someone opened their mouth, I was a ravenous lion waiting to disagree. We must learn the character of Christ Perfect love and humility in the context of the work of Christ, disagreeing that the the gospel would go forth. Now is a time of great disagreement in our culture. So many opinions, politics, medicine, mandates, so many issues to decide on. Have one great opinion in this life. Christ and him crucified. Let everything else go in this life. Wean yourself from the desire to be so outspoken about so many things. Be outspoken about one thing. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus disagrees perfectly in this context. And in his response, he gives us a major piece of marriage theology. Our second point is a brief theology of marriage, or one key element of human marriage. Verse 24, 
Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are mistaken, that you do not understand the Scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 25, I believe, should be very surprising to us. What? This cuts against a deep cultural presupposition that romantic love endures forever. And I want us to think about it this way. So think with me for a moment how important relationships are in this life. What are most movies about? Relationships. What are most songs about? Relationships. Either the desire and the hope of romantic relational love or the broken-hearted country song of what was lost or that never was. What are most fiction books about? Relationships. Or they're seasoned with relationships. What is the single greatest drama from elementary school to middle school to high school on into college and maybe in all of life relationships? Thanks. What drives almost all of marketing in media? I would say two things. Probably comfort and image Unto relationships. Look this way, dress this way, we'll package you this way so that they'll notice you and relationship will ensue. Until a person is married, what is one of the most persistent temporal questions they are asking? Where is she? Where is he? Will I be married? When will I be married? If, if and when? If you are married, what rightly dominates most of your thoughts and actions in this life, your marriage. It should. A one flesh relationship. And so is there any question that marriage or the desire for relationships is a dominant theme in our human experience, if not the greatest temporal, temporal pursuit and longing in this life? My dad passed away last year, and we moved my mom in with us until she passed away six months later. And as she declined with Alzheimer's, she often thought that I was her husband, that I was my dad. Probably one of the most uncomfortable situations of my life, but also one of the most instructive. It was her deep, deep love for this man. After 59 years of marriage, and I had to navigate it really delicately because it was, it was sacred ground. Her love for him was profound, and his, and his perceived presence through me brought her peace and comfort like no other person could. Marriage, the commitment, the uniqueness of the relationship, the forgiveness, the perseverance, and the oneness of love between a man and a woman is mysterious. And simply like nothing else we experience in this life. Why is that? Because God made us that way. He made us deeply relational. With the potential to be married. We desire to love and be loved. To belong to someone. To commit. To unite. To rely on each other. To walk through life together. Marriage is where we come home to. It's where we are accepted and affirmed and cherished and encouraged. There is a sense in which we should rightly despise the cliche, happily ever after, Prince Charming narrative and mindset of our culture. It's portrayed for, uh, portrayed for us ad nauseum in Disney movies, Hallmark movies, but before we distance ourselves from the worldly version of relational pursuit, we cannot deny that the world longs for this. And you and I long for this. 
more than we are willing to admit. There is a little Disney princess in all of us. Longing for what? An eternal love relationship. And Jesus in our text, in one sentence, brings human marriage to an end forever. It won't be that way in heaven. They will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but they will be like the angels. In this way, they'll be like the angels. They will not marry or be given in marriage. And so I think we should rightly step back and say, what? Marriage is temporal? Marriage is time boxed? I think this text demands we wrestle with marriage, with the design of marriage, the desire for marriage, the end of marriage. And here's where I think we struggle. Ladies, imagine for a moment your husband, or if you're single, that special man that you hope God brings into your life. And he gets down on his knee, and he cracks open that little ring box, and he looks deep into your eyes, and he says, sweetie, you are the love of my life. I love you. Will you marry me? For a while. It doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't, it doesn't fully scratch the itch of the soul to belong and to commit forever. To be completed by that special someone. And so we say till death do us part, but it almost seems like a pause until the marriage reboots in heaven. Not a full stop like Jesus is saying. And so I think there's a very real tension in this verse between what we long for in marriage and what marriage ultimately means in redemptive history. So let me give you a two-minute biblical theology, a quick little survey of marriage as it pertains to what Jesus is saying. God made us male and female. He made us two genders. He didn't have to, but he did. And he did it perfectly, wonderfully, so that a man and a woman could unite in marriage and become one flesh, physically, relationally, to experience, to some imperfect degree, a taste of what persevering relational oneness might be like. And he did this to portray and picture his love for us in Christ in the gospel. And so through all redemptive history, the text is moving forward, moving marriage toward this goal of gospel marriage. All through the Bible, marriage is developed masterfully, perfectly to lead us to the ultimate final marriage, Christ and the church. God defines marriage in Genesis 2. And as the Old Testament unfolds, he portrays the nation of Israel as his wife by covenant. He marries her. He even divorces her for unfaithfulness. He then prophesies the coming new covenant in old covenant marriage language. Listen to Jeremiah 31. It's almost the exchange of, the, of, of marriage in redemptive history. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, and the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And on their heart, I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And we have an entire book of the Bible devoted to marital love, the Song of Solomon, a book that simply makes everyone blush, that nobody reads in family devotions because of its intimate and explicit description of, of romantic love. It celebrates that relational love between a man and a woman. And it's right, and it's godly, and it's unto this picture of Christ and the church. And then finally, Jesus comes. And he comes as the perfect husband, perfect in every way. He comes as the bridegroom, coming for his bride to lay down his life to save her, to love her and cherish her and nourish her. For how long? Forever. 
this is the marriage that all marriage is pointing to, that all marriage is longing for, and it comes to us in the person of Christ through the cross of Christ, through his death and resurrection, and it answers every question human marriage is asking in this life, and it fulfills every longing human marriage simply cannot ultimately fulfill. So here's how I'd like you to think about marriage, human marriage, and the eternal marriage of Christ and the church. I think of it like a booster rocket on a rocket ship. That at launch, it seems like all the focus, the booster rockets are firing. There's fire and smoke, and it's powerful, and we have liftoff. No one really thinks about the cargo at liftoff. They think about the liftoff. And then at some point, the booster rockets have done their job, and it's time for them to stop burning and to fall off in the atmosphere. Why? Because the cargo is the issue. The mission is the issue. The booster rockets were for a purpose, for a season, and when they are finished, they're finished. They must drop off. And so I want to give you two key reasons it is good that human marriage ends. And it's not because I'm not wonderfully, happily married to my wife. But the text makes us think about these things. I love being married to Heather. But number one, marriage, it is good that marriage ends to prevent, number one, to prevent the idolatry of the picture. So the picture doesn't get confused with the reality. I have a unique ministry in my marriage with Heather. I don't like to boast, but I'm pretty good at it. I have an ongoing ministry of preventing her from making an idol out of our marriage, (laughs) from making an idol out of me. And so, how do you do this, you may ask, (laughs) and do it so well? I mess up (laughs) a lot, and I hate it, and I don't want to do it, but I point her to Christ in two very specific ways, positively. As we read and study and talk and pray and exemplify Christ to each other and negatively as I fail. And we, by necessity, point each other to a greater spouse, to the ultimate husband, Jesus Christ. Do not let your marriage become an idol. Marriage is a picture and it is not ultimate. That doesn't mean that the love is not real, that the relationship is not a amazing blessing in every way. I love being married to Heather, but by design, it is not absolute. How do we know that? It ends. And because it's between two sinners who could never remedy the deepest need of the soul to be one with God forever through righteousness. You don't have to be married to idolize marriage. You could be single, you could be divorced, you could be widowed, young, old, but longing for someone to save you through earthly human marriage, to complete you, to bring the forgiveness and meaning and purpose and eternal love that we all want so desperately. That person is only Christ himself. It is good that there is a tension between the joy of marriage and the end of marriage. In some sense, it is right that I don't have a category for not being married to Heather in heaven. I don't don't quite get that. Because she portrays the gospel to me so well. She loves me so well. It feels like our marriage could go on forever. But it won't. And so by faith, I want to be the best husband I can in this life. I want our marriage to be all it can possibly be so that we experience the booster rockets of what God designed to be booster rockets. And all the while to be very mindful of the cargo and the mission. We are carrying around in our relationship the very picture of eternal love between Christ and the church. And when it's over... And we have passed from this life, and we see each other in heaven. 
there in the presence of Christ. It will be so wonderful, so rich and deep and wide will the love of Christ be for us when we see him face to face and not for a second will we regret not being married in heaven. There will be no sorrow, even that she's not my wife. Why? Because the fullness of marriage has come and Christ will be our all in all. The mission will be completed. We won't be crying about booster rockets falling into the sea. Oneness with God in Christ will be the eternal song of every married person in this life and in the next. I believe that by faith, even though I don't quite get it. I don't have a category for that. So I I must believe it by faith. And I must move on really to to point number two, and it's this. The second reason human marriage must end is this, to promote the glory of the reality. There won't be human marriage in in heaven, but there most certainly will be marriage. A bride, a groom, a wedding feast, and a celebration of oneness gained through the sacrifice of the groom that will last forever and ever. Marriage is forever, just not mine, just not the human institution. Jesus clearly marks the end of the picture, and in doing so, he demands that we consider the glory of the reality and meditate on it. If my marriage will end, I must consider my marriage to Christ. And we do this from two vantage points. We do this from a position of loss or gain regarding our experience of earthly marriage. And this is simply God's sovereignty in our lives. If your marriage is great and you're close and there's peace and joy and forgiveness and all you want to do is share more of your life with your spouse, then you are left to believe by faith that as good as this is, the full expression of heavenly marriage will be better. Christ is better now, and he will most certainly be better then. This momentary marriage gives us then the categories of joy that I would have never known here on earth, and they point me to heaven. Those categories are only a shadow of the eternal relational oneness of Christ and his church. And so don't let the joys of marriage be an end in themselves. Its joys are given by God in gospel categories that they might turn your sights towards Christ. Believing that the reality is infinitely better than the picture. But if you aren't married, and you long to be married, or if your marriage is hard, it's difficult, it's not what you hoped for. If you're divorced, and your heart is broken because of a failed marriage, or you're you're widowed after many years, of marriage. Don't evaluate evaluate yourself based on your human marriage status. Don't lose hope. You will lose nothing in the end. Whether your hopes and dreams of this life are fulfilled or not, your true husband has come. And when you see him, he will wipe every tear from your face, and we will enter the joy of our master. Whether we are single, married, divorced, widowed, there will be no lack in heaven. There is no spiritual singleness for those in Christ, and there will be no singleness forever in heaven due to the eternal marriage between Christ and his church. And that marriage will be ultimate, and it will be overwhelming and sweet. And he will come on a white horse, and he will take us to live in his father's house forever. And when he does, we will be home, and we will be forgiven and satisfied and perfectly loved, made completely new to know him and worship him. And so wait for it by faith and dream of it and meditate on it. My beloved will come for me regardless of your current marital status. Jesus answers the question of the Sadducees, but he seems most concerned about their denial of the resurrection. Thirdly and finally, a brief theology of resurrection. Look in verse 26. 
But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. Jesus defends a bodily resurrection from Exodus 3, 6 in the Pentateuch, the very scriptures that the Sadducees taught and held as authoritative. When God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, and he's preparing to deliver his people out of slavery in Egypt because of his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he identifies himself as their God, and he does it this way. But before we read it again, these guys have been dead for hundreds of years when he says this. But he speaks of them as, as being their God presently and personally. I am right now the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Right now, I'm right now their God, the God of the living and God made promises to these men, and death didn't end those promises. They were still alive, even though their bodies were dead. They were alive, and they would be resurrected on the last day. Because when God makes a promise, he fulfills the promise, and he won't let you die so that he becomes a liar. What a great statement. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. And very quickly and very briefly, I want to give us nine very succinct implications of the resurrection. The first is this. There most certainly is a resurrection. It's resurrection 101. There is a resurrection for God's people, without a doubt. Based on the text of Exodus 3, 6, Jesus' affirmation of who God actually is, the God of the living, and because of an empty tomb when Christ rose from the dead. It is the very foundation of our faith. Secondly, the Sadducees were wrong. They were greatly mistaken. You cannot deny the future. You cannot just wipe away what God has ordained, what Christ died for. The Sadducees were greatly mistaken. And if you believe that life just ends at death, then the Bible would say you are greatly mistaken. I know the appeal. I was afraid of eternity as a child. It seemed too big. It seemed too ominous. I didn't want, any, I didn't want anything to do with the gospel because it, it seemed like it would usher you into this deep ocean of eternity that was so scary. I know the appeal. Many people live such a hard life. It's so difficult in this life. They just want it to end and be done, done. But my experience and my desire can never define truth. The Bible tells us there is a resurrection, and so we must believe that there is a resurrection. Jesus universally disagrees with that denial. Thirdly, this mistake, the denial of the resurrection of an afterlife, could cost you your soul in hell. Meaning, this life really matters. What you do with Christ really matters. Very important. You will not prepare for what you do not believe will happen. You will not pack for a trip you don't think you are taking. What Jesus affirms here is not the resurrection of, his, of, of just his people. The Bible affirms all people will rise. The righteous and the wicked. We will all be resurrected, resurrected to heaven or to hell. Listen to Acts 24, 15. Paul before Felix says, there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And so you individually must answer this question. Who is righteous? Am I righteous? Will I enter heaven? And you know in your heart that you are not. And so what are you to do? Try harder to be righteous? Please don't. The Bible says, flee to Christ. Put your trust in Christ. He came to save sinners like you by dying on a cross to take the penalty of our sin. Put your faith in Christ and he will forgive all of it 
every sin and make you righteous, utterly righteous in him. And he will clothe you with the righteousness that you need. And you will rise from the dead and you will enter heaven and not hell. And what's the cost? The Bible says it's free. There is no cost to the gospel. He gives us away for free. He offers himself to you today for free by his grace. Why would you turn from a Christ who offers you eternal life and has accomplished everything you need to be forgiven and resurrected to heaven? Fourthly, you personally will rise from the dead to eternal life if you have faith in Christ. Turn to John chapter 6. And as you do, think about this. This is not just a doctrine. Resurrection is not just a doctrine that we study. This will be our experience. Personally, powerfully, we will rise from the dead. God will call us out of the grave and our body and soul will be rejoined, remade, perfectly suited for heaven. Believe it personally. Wait for it personally. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. The gospel invitation. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Christian, weak or strong, young or old, if you have put your faith in Christ He's not going to lose you. But he personally, by promise, will raise you up himself. Jesus personally will raise you personally from the dead on the last day. What could be better? An empty tomb, a resurrected Christ, and a certain promise that when it's time to rise, we will rise. Fifthly, you will rise from the dead because Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus was certain about his resurrection and his guarantees ours. So we should be certain about ours. Just listen to Luke 13, 31. Just at that time, some Pharisees approached, saying to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. The third day was Jesus' resurrection day. Tell that fox the Messiah is here, and he will do what he came to do. I will reach my goal. Jesus didn't fear Herod. He was focused on the cross, on the resurrection, his and ours, and nothing would stop him. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who are asleep. The first fruits, meaning what was picked first to guarantee what was to come later. Christ's resurrection guarantees our resurrection. Number six, God kept his covenant promise to these three men of faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he will keep his promise to you in the gospel. His promise to raise you from the dead and bring you home to heaven. He has never broken a promise, and he never will break a promise. And you and I will rise from the dead because God keeps his covenant. Number seven, there is great hope today. There is great reason to persevere because of his resurrection and ours. The resurrection should move us. It should bless us. It should keep us, inspire us to live for Christ. I love the hymn, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Do you live a gloomy, weighted down Christian life, depressed and despairing? Look up and watch for your beloved. He's coming. He's coming soon. There is great joy today and there's great joy in what's next. There is great joy in resurrection hope. Don't be drawn down into this world and all the news and the confusion. Wait like a bride waiting for her groom. Eighthly, all that have gone before us from Abraham to believers, we've lost in our lifetime are alive right now. 
awaiting resurrection and will rise on that day. Jesus lost none of his people to death. God is the God of Abraham and you and me and every believer that you know that has died in Christ. I love thinking about my parents with Christ. I love thinking about what they're doing, what they're seeing. And it overshadows my grief and it blesses me and it heals me. Let's finish with 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this, re- for this, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with with these words. Let's pray. Father, thank you that standing right there in front of the Sadducees was the very bridegroom of the eternal marriage, was the resurrection and the life himself the full answer to their questions. God, may he be the full answer to all of our questions. God, help us to live in light of these truths that marriage ends to give way for the eternal marriage between Christ and his bride. God, help us to live in light of a coming resurrection, a sure resurrection. May it encourage us and give us great hope and great joy in Christ. And for those who are outside of Christ, I pray that you would give them faith, that they would turn and look and believe and be born again through the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, thank you. For this text, thank you for your son, our beloved bridegroom, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.